We're going to have to cut this interview, Nick. I'm not going to go into any more detail. I'm leaving. I'm glad. Thanks a lot, Society, for railroading my ass. Oscar Ray Bolin. In the mid-1980s, Oscar Ray Bolin killed three women throughout the Tampa area. Following his arrest, Bolin's cousin testified against him and implicated him in a fourth homicide. He received three death sentences and was executed on January 7, 2016 at the age of 53. One day before his death, Bolin was interviewed by Tampa's Fox 13. How are you feeling this morning? <laughs> mm -hmm. A little numb. I mean, I don't know how this how you would expect someone to feel. I mean, if they told you tomorrow you'd die, and how would you feel? Bolin appears calm and courteous throughout the interview, even expressing fear and worry about his upcoming execution. He also professes his innocence, something he continuously maintained throughout his imprisonment. So you're saying you didn't murder these women? No. You didn't murder Natalie Holly? No. Stephanie Collins? No. Terry Lynn Matthews? No, no. I didn't know. I've never seen them. Never met him. Bolin looks and sounds like a nice enough guy, which only makes the darkness underneath seem that much more sinister. After 28 years of this, <laughs> it's been in this box for 28 years. It's a release. My punishment's over. They can't hurt me no more. Richard Ramirez. As far as Satan is concerned, I, I believe uh, in a malevolent being. Uh, his description eludes me, but I, I have felt powers that are evil. A notorious serial killer known as the Night Stalker, Ramirez terrorized California with his violent burglaries, assaults, and killings. Ramirez took the lives of at least 15 people and was convicted of 13 homicides, leading to 19 separate death sentences. In 1993, Inside Edition aired an interview with Ramirez, who was then awaiting execution on death row. They are desires, whereas if, where if I didn't give in to them, I would be crushed by them. Among other discussion points, he explained his theories on the psychological development of serial killers like himself. Even more chilling, when asked why he killed his victims, Ramirez hides a smile and simply says, uh, No comments, no comments. I, I cannot answer that at this time. Ramirez was still awaiting execution in 2013 when he died of cancer. Carol Cole. A very prolific serial killer, Carol Cole claimed at least 16 victims throughout his life, although he confessed to killing 35. He was originally sentenced to life in prison in Texas, but was given the death penalty following his extradition to Nevada. Three days before his execution, Cole granted an interview to Las Vegas's KLAS-TV. While smoking a cigarette, Cole shows complete indifference for his own life, but expresses remorse for his crimes. Why not fight for your life? I just don't care to. Are you sorry? For the victim? Yes. Yes. In the end, he even claims that he deserves to die for what he did. Well, it's, it's the ultimate question. It is, it is the question. For what I did, yes, I, I think I deserve to die. Cole is very quiet and reserved, and aside from some brief flashes, doesn't show much emotion. It makes the interview all the more disturbing. And condemn myself for, for many years. Because I can just imagine what that there, what her life might have been like. Wesley Allen Dodd. On January 5th, 1993, Wesley Allen Dodd was executed by hanging, making him the first American criminal to be legally hanged in nearly 30 years. Between September and November of 1989, Dodd assaulted and killed three young men leading to his moniker, the Vancouver Child Killer. Dodd's final interview is absolutely bone-chilling. With complete confidence, Dodd states that he would kill again if set free, and that he, quote, liked what he did. I've done it before, and at the time, I liked it. He also claims that his execution would make a great example for future criminals. Throughout his interview, Dodd proves that he was fully self-aware, and a self-aware killer is a very scary thing. You look forward to dying? In a way, yeah, I think it'd be a relief. I don't have to think about all these things anymore. Uh, and I know that's the only way I can guarantee I'm not gonna hurt anybody else. Velma Barfield. The first woman to be lethally injected, Velma Barfield killed six people between 1969 and 1978. 
she was convicted for just one homicide, that of her boyfriend, Roland Stewart Taylor. However, it was enough to ensure a death sentence, and Barfield was executed on November 2, 1984. Her interview with Raleigh's WBTV shows a woman in pain rather than one who causes it. She seemingly attempts to garner sympathy by speaking about her isolation in prison and her years-long battle with drugs. The last 10 years was just like that, uh, years of a drug nightmare. She also credits God for getting her through the trials and tribulations of prison life. Living in prison every day is a struggle, even at its best. And um, I know that without him and the, his strength that has sustained me, I couldn't have made it even this far. While Barfield apologizes for her crimes, most of the interview is about her, and it may rub many viewers the wrong way. Today, if it were possible, I wish that I could take every bit of hurt on myself. John Wayne Gacy, known widely as the killer clown, John Wayne Gacy claimed at least 33 lives inside his suburban Chicago home. At the time, Gacy set an American record for the most homicide convictions. In 1992, he spoke with Walter Jacobson of CBS2 Chicago as part of a television event. In a rather shocking and unnerving turn of events, Gacy played innocent. If they want to be convinced they're brainwashed into what they believe, then fine, then go ahead and kill me. But vengeance is mine, say it the Lord, because you will have executed somebody that didn't commit the crime. He even claimed that he took a, quote, truth serum, and that that proved his innocence. I've taken th uh, five and a half hours, three and a half hours of truth serum, and under, under sodium amethyl, the maximum amount that I could have, it shows that I have no knowledge of the crime whatsoever. Like Barfield, Gacy also plays the sympathy card, portraying himself as a loving family man. I, I've always uh, looked after my children, even now. Yet sometimes, the veneer slips, and Jacobson is quick to notice the scheming man underneath. It's all quite eerie, and probably not at all what viewers were expecting. Ted Bundy. On January 23, 1989, Ted Bundy, perhaps the most notorious serial killer in American history, was visited by a psychologist named James Dobson, and it showcases his well-publicized powers of manipulation. Bundy appears clean and well-dressed, offering a friendly next-door neighbor vibe. What's going through my mind right now is to use the minutes and hours that I have left as fruitfully as possible and see what happens. He's charismatic, charming, and well-spoken, not at all what one would expect from a serial killer. Finally, he latches on to Dobson's evangelical beliefs, blaming both the adult film industry and violence in the media for his crimes. This kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior. It fueled your fantasies. Fueled, didn't it? Well, in, in the beginning, it fuels this kind of thought process. Biographers and historians argue that this is a prime example of classic Bundy subterfuge. Knowing that, the footage comes across as deeply ominous and foreboding. The term psychopath is often bandied around too often, but in this case, many agree that the term fits. I couldn't control it anymore, that these barriers that, that I had, had been, uh, I had learned as a child uh, and had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. Eileen Warnos. The final interview with Eileen Warnos is the complete antithesis of Ted Bundy's. Warnos shot and killed seven men in the span of one year, and while she claimed self-defense, she was found guilty of six homicides and sentenced to death. Warnos's final interview is deeply troubling. But you're okay now. I'm okay, I'm okay. God is gonna be there, Jesus Christ's gonna be there, all the angels and everything. She often widens her eyes and yells in a confrontational tone, and even verbally attacks the interviewer, Nick Broomfield. She makes bizarre claims like getting tortured by, quote, sonic pressure. And they were using sonic pressure on my head since 1997. Sonic and pressure. And every time I was trying to write something, I, they'd, and I, I think they had some kind of eye in the cell, I'm not sure, but every time I started writing something, it went up higher. So I'm thinking that probably had the TV rigged. She states that dying will be like Star Trek, 
and that she'll go on to colonize another planet. I think it's going to be more like Star Trek, beaming me up into a space vehicle, man. Then I move on, recolonize to another planet or whatever. But it's whatever's a beyond. I know it's going to be good because I didn't do anything as wrong as they said. Warnos's violent past, her abrasive behavior, and her mental state all combine to create some truly uncomfortable viewing. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.